Welcome everybody to another episode of the Main Street Business Podcast. My name is Mark Kohler, yours truly, and I'm here with the amazing Matt Sorensen, here talking about small business, legal, tax, business strategies, self-directing, a little bit, because we have a sister mm-hmm. podcast that focuses on you investing your retirement account and what you know best, but today's open forum, our special day, Matt. So- yeah, this is, this is the special day for the listeners. This is where we talk about what you want to talk about when you're like, guys, stop talking about this dumb stuff. Okay, then submit a question at MainStreetBusiness.com. Submit a question. You can go right there on the homepage to submit that. And you can see we've got a lot of questions in there. We've had a lot posted through social. Um, Mark and I are just going to try and have some fun, say something smart, maybe give you a tip that one of the fellow listeners has put in. Or maybe you've got your own question in the queue you're waiting for us to get to. Um, so thanks for everyone for, uh, submitting all those. We do have a lot. This might be a record number of questions. I can't say we'll get to all of them, Yeah, but there's been a record number of submissions. Yeah. I'm going to say we're not going to get to them all, but we're going to, we're going to try to do is combine, divide, conquer, whatever generals would do on the line of a battle. You know, they're just going to say, mm-hmm. let's knock out a we're few gonna over here. Outflank it. Yeah. We're going to all these questions. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to nuke some of them. Just do them all at once. Uh, let me help out. Buy low, sell high. Mm. There you go. That just solved at least mm. half the questions. Uh, no. Yep. Yep. All right. A couple of current Probably events. You know. Yeah. New, news in the, in the news, first of all. Uh, Ooh, okay. April 15th. Usually April 14th is a nutty day. Tomorrow would be tax day normally. It is not. For those that have been living under a rock or on a boat traveling across the world on the ocean and you're just tapped in it's going to be may 17th that's the day um yeah so if you normally make a deposit with your taxes or you're worried about filing an extension you're not prepared there are no penalties no interest if you Mm -hmm. wait till may 17th for what you would normally deposit for your 2020 taxes however If some of you are still making your, for those of you that need to make your regular 2021 first quarter deposit, those are due tomorrow. So uh, those that are doing payroll reports for first quarter 2021, those are still due by the end of this month. So it's just your 1040 stuff, really, that you need to. Yeah, and I had my number, uh, my number one client call me and ask me about the tax deadline today, and actually asked those two exact same questions. Hmm. Was that my yeah. mom? That was my mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, I, it's so funny because it's like, you know, she sends me her tax return. My mom, she, uh, uh, she actually went did accounting in undergrad before getting married, and she later went back became a nurse. But, um, and so she's always like love doing taxes if you can believe that mm. uh like many of our listeners i presume yes. they li- like to do their own taxes and she always has they got rental properties and stuff and so i have to review it every year and i asked and i just like i asked the same questions every year on her return why are you doing this what about this you should really buy some new rental properties like they've owned rental properties so long they depreciated them to zero like literally <laughs> over 30 years <laughs> so it's like no more depreciation these but they're so, anyways so um so yeah uh you got till may 17th even to pay i thought that was generous the 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 delay to file i thought was eh, that made sense but even the pay yeah. that was just a little unexpected from the irs thank you yeah, yeah. they're all you're welcome yeah <laughs> um, uh now a couple other final notes um I need to give an important disclaimer on a regular basis because on our show, we love to share strategies, ideas. Like Matt just said, mom, buy another rental. Um, We've never been sued from a a client or a listener or a reader, knock on wood, that has said, you told me to do this and I lost money. Because I think we do make this clear enough, but it's always an important reminder. When we're talking about buying real estate, cryptocurrency investing, trading, gold. Um, I'm buying some cows. I'm excited to give a report on my cow purchase. Since I've been watching Yellowstone, I am buying a herd. I don't know what really a herd, how many cows you need to qualify as a herd, but yeah. I'm going to have 10, 10 cows. Okay. 
Yeah. They're, yeah. That's don't. at least like a men's basketball team. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. not a football team, but you know, you could yeah. feel the get a team on the court. I could get a team on the court. Um, so, so with the, they're not going to be in my backyard people, uh, but I've got a sweet plan. We'll be talking about that more. So anyway, the point is, as we talk about strategies and investments, we do that because we want you, the small business owner, to feel empowered that you work so hard on your business and you take that money, where do I deploy it? We don't want you to always drive all your profits right back into your business and certainly not into buying a sports car or a bigger house or live in large. We want you to save your money, pay off debt, prepare for any recessions in the future and invest. But what do you invest in? Well, I hate to say we're a little anti Wall Street in the sense we are pro Main Street. So I'm not saying a little bit of ETF, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, all those things are inherently bad. And to have a little bit of your portfolio in that makes sense. But we would encourage more of our clients to have the far majority of their investments in stuff they know. Invest in what you do best. And so if that's precious metals, small business, private equities, a restaurant down the street, your brother's carpet cleaning business, um, crypto, we teach how to do that. So um, so disclaimer, heard and stated. Okay. Yeah. You want to add to that, Matt? <laughs> no, I would just, let's just put that letter to the editor out there and maybe it'll get published. I thought that was very, you know. Okay. Uh, this had to be said though. Thanks for doing that. Okay. So let's get into questions. You choose first. Let's get going. Some people are like freaking A, quit screwing yeah. around. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I liked, um, I like this question from Glenn. Okay. He said, uh, hello. Now, Matt, fellas. tell me, is this on our website? Or this is on from... the website. Submit a question. Okay. Because yeah. I'll mark it as red. Glenn. Glenn. Says, I'm a partner in a small LLC. Part of my expenses this year have been for travel as part of a podcast production. Cool. What is the best way to have the company reimburse my expenses? He says, P.S. Lawyers or Liars is a great book. I've been searching for the OJ <laughs> information for many years. <laughs> That's Mark's first book. So, yeah, I have uh, the whole chapter. Be like OJ. I will recommend the AMC OJ trial miniseries. Oh my gosh! You can get it on Netflix, I believe. Okay, is that one the one with Cuba Gooding Jr. and John Travolta? No. Oh, that one's awesome. Hold it, is it Cuba? Yeah, he plays OJ, and you got uh. Um, pull Ross up. from Friends plays. Uh, yes, yes, yes. That's yeah. the good one. Yes, yeah, yeah. that yeah. is excellent. Yeah, uh, Travolta is um, the legal Zoom guy. What's his name? Robert Shapiro. Yeah, and I would say this: anybody that I even had my kids. This is this is crazy. <laughs> this is over. I mean, how many years ago now is this? Um, yeah, like twenty it, years maybe. Oh no no no! It's more than that. Um, twenty five. Yeah. So, High yeah. school for me. So that's 25, maybe. Yeah, I had my kids watch this. Uh, it was 1994. Uh, the, and so that's just crazy. So 30 years ago where this was the trial. And um, I had my kids listen to this show or watch the show. And they were blown away. They're like, this is real? And so, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yep. So go ahead, Matt. All right. Okay. Um, he, so let's let's hit this question. Now, the nice thing is, is Glenn is a partner in this business. Now, he, presumably, he's been paying for these expenses himself. If the company was paying for all these expenses, the company's just going to expense those things. But if Glenn, if you've been paying for those expenses, what we would do is you would have the you would want to submit evidence of those expenses for your own record keeping and for tax purposes, because the company is now going to take an expense for it. It's going to cut you a check of reimbursement for those expenses that you'd paid. And then the company is going to take those expenses on its books, which means all your partners, of course, are going to share in that cost and expense by that happening at the company level. So um, I think that's the best you have the company cut a check to you as reimbursement, give the company or whoever in your group is doing the accounting records of those receipts um, and travel expenses, and then the company will take those expenses on your partnership LLC tax. And I presume you guys are uh, filing as a partnership 1065. Okay. And if I may add quickly, and far, I'm sorry, folks, we love to keep this light and 
joke around a little bit. So we'll, we'll burn through some heavy topics real quick here and, and help get you some content that'll help you. This is so important what Glenn's asking, because think about this, everybody. He's working for a business as a partner and wants to be reimbursed for expenses the company is willing to reimburse him for. Well, frankly, Matt's answer would work in any situation. I don't care if you're an employee, an owner, an officer. If you've got expenses and the company said we'll pay for them, you submit your receipt. That's tax-free income to you. So you paid for it personally. The company's going to reimburse you. The company gets the write-off. It's tax-free to you. Here's where the problem comes in. When you're a partner in an LLC, let's say Matt and I are partners in an LLC. Uh, we're not. I'll explain why. But Matt, if we're partners in an LLC and I go down to Florida and I shoot some video for our podcast, like this situation Glenn's doing, and I go, hey, I'm going to get reimbursed. Matt's like, Psh, screw you. I'm not paying you for your trip to Florida. That was half play. Well, I go, I want to get yeah. reimbursed. And he goes, well, I'm not going to reimburse you from the company. You write it off on your own return. Can I? Well, in a partnership, LLC, I would say that this is this is live, true example. I, I would say that <laughs> <laughs> jerk. <laughs> you would. I'd say it to you. I know you are, but what am I? That's where you say, shut up, Richard. <laughs> Tommy boy. OK, so uh, so if Matt says I'm not going to reimburse you, then I have to write it off on my personal return. Can I? In this situation, I can. It is classified as an unreimbursed partnership expense. It's on page two of the schedule E as an echo. Make sure you bring that up with your accountant. You should go to your accountant and go, hey, I was in an LLC and I got a K-1. And here's a list of all the expenses that I wrote off that are related to my business. But my freaking partner, Matt Sorensen, would not reimburse me. And they go, oh, and the accountant's going to put those on your tax return. Now, here's the third issue, though. Let's say that Matt and I are making so much money, we're paying self-employment tax. What are we going to want to do? Try to solve it with an S-corp. Well, if we create an S-corporation between the two of us and we're not going to reimburse each other, there's no way to write that off. That's an unreimbursed employee expense because we're now an S-corp. We're not a partnership anymore. There's no line for this on the tax return anymore. Now, some of you may go, well, I itemize. I get to write off unreimbursed employee expenses. Not anymore. That got taken away with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So what do you do? You're, you're toast. So this is a chapter in my book, the Tax and Legal Playbook, where Glenn, when you start making too much money in that partnership, you've got to each set up an S-corp to be partners in an LLC. Now you get the best of both worlds. You can reimburse each other for expenses. You can write off your expenses, even if your partner doesn't want to reimburse for them. And the S-Corp partnership in an LLC is the solution. We teach it every day. We have clients setting the structure up all the time. And it's so important. That yeah. is the takeaway there. Yeah. Love it. Okay. Um, man, that was some good detail there. I didn't know that. I learned something today. There you go. I mean, I, I knew we would always use the S-Corp there, but I didn't know the difference between the unreimbursed expenses on the 1065 versus the the S Corp 1120S. Wow. God. Okay. I'm going to fill the question here. And then Matt, I'm going to give you a little lead on the next one. This was a, oh, okay. a question that came through our firm this morning. And this is tricky. In Tennessee, if I'm setting up an LLC, there is a franchise tax that I need to pay for my LLC. Even though there's no state income tax, I've got this franchise tax for my LLC. Well, yeah. I can get around it with what's called the fonts exemption. That's a family owned company. So if I own the company, I can get around it with a fonts exemption. Matt, the question is, and you're gonna to get to answer this here in a minute, with the fonts, does do I can I do that with an LLC owned by my IRA or solo 401k? So think about that. Okay. okay. I want to take I thought the about it before. Okay. <laughs> and I, I was gonna have looked. I've had Susan, I was going to have Susan look into it before the show, but I didn't have a chance. So I'm hoping you can answer it for us. Okay. Um, everybody, do you know last year over 4.4 million new businesses were created, LLCs and corporations? That's why a lot of people are having these questions because people like Glenn, maybe Glenn, that says, oh, I have an LLC with a partner. How do I do this? He's never had to deal with that before. And a lot of people went and set up their entity on LegalZoom or some online setup. And they now are like, how do I run this thing? 
And that's why our podcast has been booming. We're grateful many of you are here. Okay, this is a question from DJK Buys Homes. I want to rent my home to my child and write off the depreciation just like a rental. Oh my gosh, I just got chills. I'm just not, and I'm not kidding. DJK Buys Homes, I <laughs> preach to the choir, buddy. I love that. We've yeah. been doing that for years. Now, I'll just give a quick tip here. A yeah, lot of couple, people, yeah. A lot of people say, well, Matt said buy a rental. I don't know where to buy a rental. And I, I live in Southern California and rentals are too expensive and they're not going to cash flow. The first place I like clients to buy rentals is if your business is renting commercial space. Buy your own building to rent to your business. Convert a home into a business if it's commercially zoned for that. Quit paying rent to someone else. That's first. Number two I got a kid going to college. I got a kid that needs money. I got a kid that's freaking renting somewhere. Buy the rental, make them the property manager and the tenant, and you get the write-offs. And even if you're like, well, I'm still supplementing the rent, that's okay. We'll claim the rent as a gift to the child who's now paying rent back to you. And so now you've generated a rental property with your child going to college. That's number two. Number three, maybe you're helping a parent that needs to rent from you so they can qualify for elder law type planning strategies of Medicaid or Medi-Cal. You could own the home and rent it to your mom or dad. And finally, Matt Sorensen, who has been a wonderful example of this, is every time Matt buys a home and moves to a new place, he doesn't sell the home. He turns it into a rental. So Matt has garnered several rentals that used to be prior residences. And I think that's a great strategy. There's three or four just right off. So DJK Homes, do it. Yeah. Learn more, call our accounting firm, law firm, <clears throat> have the lawyers set you up in LLC, get your kids in there. Yep. My other uh, tip on that is now keep in mind, if this is your prior residence, this is something you want to do. And Mark mentioned, I've done this a number of times, is um, the sale of home exemption. So you're going to lose the sale of home exemption. So this is a property that has a lot of appreciation in it and you start renting it to a child. You've got three years from the time you've been out of it um for it to uh still get the sell of home exemption so if it's highly appreciated you may want you know and maybe that's a great time for your kid to rent it and then get on their own feet and get to their own place you know um but just keep that that's another consideration of mine is the sell of home exemption so and i've is uh, even on some of mine that mark's mentioned i've sold some i've, I've turned some into rentals and sold one within three years uh, it was about a year ago um and i've have others that I've passed the three years and I'm just gave up the sale of home exemption, but it's good. It's a good, they're good rental properties. Mortgages are there. Easy peasy cash flows. Don't let the tax tail wag the dog on it too. So, okay. All right. Um, okay. Ready for me to take one here. This yeah, is Tennessee another fonts. Real estate question. Oh, Tennessee fonts. Oh, yeah. okay. I was the dying fonts. to know. Yeah. All right. <laughs> the fonts question. Yeah. This is family owned non corporate entity. That's the full, you know, yeah. uh, acronym there. Family um, owned non corporate entity. So Tennessee yep. says if your family owns a rental property in an LLC, you file this exemption, which you have to file yearly. Yeah. The company doesn't pay any franchise or corporate tax, for lack of a better word. Okay. So yeah. who gets it, Matt? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is my, my, uh, uh, I don't know how to say this. I'm I'm couching my answer here. I'm uh, because I've looked into this before many times, actually, um, and I I did find one person who had asked, and there was published information on a SEP, I believe, as someone that had a SEP IRA, um, who asked that owned an LLC, um, and I believe they gave positive guidance on that, saying that still that would still qualify. Here's the thing to think about, though. This is how I look at it. An IRA is a trust that you're the beneficiary of. And the family-owned non-corporate entity works if you have your revocable living trust and you're the beneficiary of it that owns the LLC. Don't you still get it in that instance? So that's all the IRA is. The IRA is a trust. And that would be our argument for anybody that has to get in that battle is um, my IRA owns this. I'm the beneficiary of it. My IRA is a trust. Give me the same treatment. But I don't know that the state of Tennessee has put any specific guidance out there. I haven't looked in the last couple of years. So sorry. Okay. I that was a tough comment. one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Did I you put it in there. Um, 
Well, okay. It, see, in, in the exemption, for those that are wondering, the general rule is at least 95% of the entity's ownership must be directly held by family members. And that would be a revocable living trust, which one could argue is a retirement account. Subs and number two, substantially all, which is 66.67% of the activity of the entity must be the production of passive income, which is a rental property. So we're off to the races. <laughs> then the research begins. You know, what is how, what is the defi definition of a family member? So I might play with this a little bit as we're answering questions here too. But okay, your question, Matt. All right, this was... Um from Elizabeth in Florida. This was on uh, submitted on the website. Um, she says, hi, Matt and Mark. Greetings from Florida. We're 1099 self-employed with individual health insurance policies. As you might imagine, our premiums are very steep and we're hoping that we might qualify for the under 65,000 modified adjusted or gross income for 2020 as we've worked less most years and we left some of our rentals unoccupied, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> and he's basically saying since we're under the 67,000, we would get subsidies um, for the health insurance. How and when does one calculate the modified adjusted gross income to determine um, if you're eligible for discount rates under ACA? Also, when we need to calculate the 2020 earnings, 2021 earnings to see when we might not be no longer be eligible. Health insurance has become such a burden. I'm thinking about leaving the country until Medicare age. Do many of your clients take this approach? Okay, couple things here, Elizabeth. Um, first you, when you apply for any subsidies as being any, you know, self-employed or just, or, you know, just a W2 employee, you're stating your income from your prior year tax return and you're making representation that it's going to be similar. So if it's changing, you do want to notify, um, the, uh, health insurance, um, um, cooperative depending on your state or if you're in a state that goes under the florida system because you will and we've had this with clients over the years if you did no longer qualified in 2021 because you ended up making more money in 2021 but you got the subsidy all year or even a partial subsidy you will get a bill or you know you you have to pay that difference now here's an idea though that, that i am Matt, suggest. let me add I, if some yeah. of you're like i don't want to notify him i want the discount and i'll just pay the pay the credit back later when I get that bill. You could do that. Yep. Just just know what's coming. So some yeah. of you may say, hey, hey, stop. And, and make sure you're setting the money aside. <laughs> yeah, set the money aside because you, yeah, people have to pay this back when they make more money in the current year based on the projection that you provided. Okay. Yeah. So um, one thing you may want to look at though, and I did this in Arizona a few years back because Arizona's ended up getting like the first few years of the Affordable Care Act, we had like one health insurance provider left for any self-employed or people getting individual policies. Like there's literally one company willing to provide those policies. It was a joke and it was super expensive. So I said, screw it. And I did a cost sharing ministry. And that is one option here, Elizabeth. If you guys don't have large medical you could look at a cost sharing ministry instead of the health insurance. This, this is an exemption from ACA and Obamacare, so you don't get the penalty. And the cost sharing ministry, basically you still pay, it's not a premium, but you're paying in to this cost sharing arrangement with other people, and then you submit your expenses. Now, most of these, the one I did, um, I really liked actually, it was not like insurance. So you only, you, you're paying cash for the doctor. But if you had a one single expense over five grand, you could submit it to the cost sharing ministry to pay. But you're not submitting stuff to go to the doctor. You get the flu shot or whatever. You're paying for that out of pocket. Your, your regular prescription drugs, like you're paying for that out of pocket. It's a single medical thing over five grand you can get reimbursed for. And that's how they keep the cost low and, and how those work. I actually, frankly, like the process because to me, that's more insurance than what our actual health insurance is. I think our health insurance system is is totally broken because you use it for everything. It's like like your car. Like if I get my car gets in an accident, I'm going to use my car insurance to fix the whole car, right? But I'm not going to use my car insurance to go get the oil changed, to get new tires on it. But we treat health insurance like that. It's insane. That creates anyway. So check out the cost sharing ministry. Yeah. <laughs> and and I would about. just add different cost sharing ministries have different policies and procedures. That was Matt's that, you know, he could submit an expense over 5K. You're going to see different types of cost sharing ministries. Um, 
Also, if you do a cost sharing ministry, you cannot fund a health savings account. Uh, you could, so there's different strategies out there. I've discussed this in an entire chapter in my book, um, the Tax and Legal Playbook. Also, we've had podcasts dedicated just to healthcare. So I'd recommend you go back into our podcast history and look at the healthcare shows, which we usually do in the fall when you're in the middle of selecting providers and enrolling and things like that. Also, this healthcare sharing ministry was fun because Matt became a minister and he was able to marry one of my kids. And I thought it was just fun. You know, it was just a lot yeah. of fun. We did it at a bar. Yeah. Anybody got some anybody got some weddings coming up? I will officiate <laughs> your wedding. I'll give a sweet tax tip and talk about how you can guys can, you know, contribute to your retirement accounts and all yeah. that. Deduct the wedding cake. I mean, it's a big deal. Uh, okay. no, if you do not have to become a minister to join a cost sharing ministry. That was a joke. Okay. Um, next question from Nick. I love this one. He says 50 K W two date W two job, a side hustle making 10,000. I rent in the Bronx of New York, no rental property. How much can I write off? Now, Nick has quickly become a quintessential example and byproduct of the 2020 COVID year. More and more, in fact, millions of Americans picked up a little side hustle to make ends meet. And some of them, we've heard from thousands of you uh, through our show and our workshops and uh, through our law firm and accounting firm. People are thrilled by this. They're like, I didn't realize how what I was missing out on. Um, the side hustle is the gateway drug to entrepreneurship, which we love to say. And so I want to welcome all of you to the show. If you have a side hustle, a side gig, or you know someone that does, tell them to come and listen to the show. Because now you're going to have to report that on your tax return. And the question is, what do I do? So here's a couple of points. Nick says, how much can I write off? Any, any expense related to the side hustle. Woo! I love this. So let's just use an example. Let's say, let's say sorry about that, folks. Let's say that Nick is driving for Uber. Cool. He's going to write off some auto expense. He's going to write off, uh, boy, cell phone, probably a home computer, a laptop, all sorts of Bluetooth devices, some office uh, expenses, supplies, equipment. He may even have some dining expenses out collaborating, working with other Uber drivers. He probably has some Uber direct expenses. There's a ton there. And the list goes on and on, depending on the type of small business or side hustle you have. So there's no limit on the expenses. It's any expense that related to your business. We have Uber drivers that show a loss. He made 10 grand on his 1099 from Uber and he's got 12 grand in expenses. Now we don't wanna show a loss every year that would help offset the W-2, but for the first couple of years you can. And then in the years to come, I'm going to write off at least 10 grand, Nick. That 10 grand is going to be tax-free income. So many of you continue to study up on this. The Schedule C as in Charlie is where you're going to report all this, Nick. I've got YouTube videos on how to write off expenses as a Uber driver, as a small business owner. My workbook, the tax uh, eight steps to start and grow your business. Look at that workbook on Amazon. Those will be very, very helpful and very affordable resources. And cool. All right. Um, I got a doozy of a question here. A doozy. I'm a, a doozy. This is uh, submitted by Instagram. Okay. Um, this was Edwin Gutierrez says, purchasing a business from my father, which he will finance. Hmm. Best way to pay him back. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Your dad will let um, you off. Seriously, yeah. your dad's going to go after you. Don't pay him back. Just yeah. walk out the door. Well, Sucker. Yeah. <laughs> Um, now you want to buy it because later down the road, when dad's no longer here, if this business is successful, all your siblings will come after you and hate you. So, okay. Here's, even if you are the one that made it totally valuable first, let me just walk through a few steps here and just buying a business. Oh my gosh. It's a whole show, well, by the way, go yeah, back to our show. prior shows. Here's first thing I'll say, don't buy his company. If he has an LLC or S corp or anything, don't buy that company. Buy the assets of the business. It's called an asset purchase versus a stock purchase. Set up your own new company. If this is an operating business. We're usually going to do an S-Corp. So you have your new S-Corp. Buy the assets of his business, his name, his customers, any equipment or inventory. Okay, you're going to buy all that stuff. 
You're going to start running all that income into your business. I would have a promissory note that you're paying him the agreed price of the business over time. He's loaning you the money and, you know, negotiate hard on the purchase price. Don't overpay for it. Um, but you've got to get a fair price because there could be some gift tax consequences if you're underpaying and it effectively become, becomes a gift for gift tax purposes. So, um, but I just document it with the note. You pay them over time. And that way, if there's any, the business has a lot of success and you grow it, any siblings or other family members that may make claims to it, you guys had a contract for it. You had a promissory note to pay them back over time and you did it. And if dad wants to forgive you the money later, he can. There might be some gift tax issues to that. As I mentioned, um, he could forgive pieces each year without uh, under the gift tax exemption, about 15 grand a year. Um, but that's what I do. Just do an asset purchase, use your own entity to start. Don't get, don't buy his entity and deal with all the tax mess and stuff he might have in his own entity. Start scratch, start from scratch freshly yourself and buy, uh, and document it with a note on what you're going to owe him. Um, Next question. Oh, it, sorry. I'm going to say this. Uh, Edwin, anybody out there thinking of buying a business from your family, just because it's family, do not cut corners on the legal side of this. Make sure you get a consultation with a, t a tax lawyer, especially too, that knows what they're doing. Um, it does not have to be expensive, but there are critical things you're going to miss out on. There's ways to save taxes over time. Are you doing an installment sale? How much is capital gain? How much is ordinary income? Is there going to be yeah. a balloon payment? How are you going to value the business? I'll tell you right now, dad's going to think it's worth more than it really is. And dad, yeah, and yeah every time. And well, dad, let me give you a good, I was like, let me give you a good metric for what, what a small business is worth. Usually four to five times of profits. So if that business has a hundred thousand in profit every year, it's going to be worth four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars. Now that's taking into account that if Dad works in the business, Dad is taking a salary. If Dad drives that business, that's he's taking a fair salary of what he'd have to pay someone to run that business. So this is after any just income he's making, right? This is the true profit. So that's just a very rough sketch of of how to value that. All right, I got There's some really good questions here. I'm going to hit an easy okay. one. Okay, we're going to hit easy and hard throughout this. Um, by the way, any of you that have questions that are related to self-directing your retirement account, we're going to be primarily taking those questions on our sister podcast, the Directed IRA podcast, right there in whatever your listening portal you're using, Spotify, Stitcher, or iTunes, yeah. just search Directed IRA podcast. You'll, it'll come right up. We'll start from the beginning there. We have a lot of beginning podcasts that really take you through the basics of getting going. And then we have an open forum to show every three weeks there as well. Okay, here's a question from uh, uh, I am Leo Delgado. Okay, Delgado. I'm just going to put Delgado. Um, now, this is a great question. It brings back, I don't know if I want to say fond memories. He says, we are starting a commercial cleaning company. Should I hire W-2s or 1099s? Oof. First, I owned a commercial cleaning business for seven years when I went through undergrad and my master's program, sold it for a profit. I was excited about that. Had 20, 25 employees on average the last couple of years of business. Carpet cleaning, van, window cleaning, stripping, waxing floors, grocery stores, all that. Sold the business, went on to law school. I was in the trenches of small business, learning how to close a sale, learning how to hire and fire and how to do the books. It was a great learning experience for me. While Matt whizzed through undergrad and law school in five to seven years, I took the long path of being an entrepreneur through uh, most of my schooling. I actually didn't graduate from law school until age 30, uh, but it was a great learning experience for me. So. I, I love the cleaning business industry. It's a great way any of you out there can make money on the side quickly. It is a wonderful side gig, side hustle. Pick up cleaning a little office building, a restaurant, take the family out. I cleaned my dad's offices as a kid. Every Wednesday night and Saturday, my mom would load us in the car. We'd go in and clean the offices. And on Saturday, we'd clean the offices and then we'd go out for pizza. And that was a huge part of my growing up was being there doing janitorial. So hence, when I was in college, I thought, I'll start a cleaning business. I know how to scrub a toilet. Um, 
it is a business. You've got to treat it like one. You're going to want an entity. You're going to have self-employment tax. Ultimately, you'll probably have an S-corp. There's a lot to learn there. Get my workbook, Eight Steps to Start Grow Your Business. The one that really opens the door for a lot of you is his question um, by uh, Mr. Delgado here. Should I hire W-2s or 1099s? It depends. And frankly, you don't have much of a choice. It depends on how you treat them. The law is going to make you treat them a certain way. And the states around the country, especially California in the last two years, has really gone hard after those trying to claim 1099 status for the workers. Uber in particular is in a big lawsuit. They're saying our people are 1099s. State of California goes, "Uh, uh, uh-uh-uh, we want to make them W-2s because it's better for them. I haven't met an Uber driver yet that wants that. It's just California imposing their freaking crap on Uber drivers. But... And I don't want to get too political here, but um, the issue is this. This if is they, the former California resident speaking. Yes, <laughs> and a former janitor. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, if you here's the story in a nutshell, and I have an article on this. I've got a YouTube video on this. Here's the deal. If you're treating them like an employee, you provide the equipment, you tell them when to work, how to work, what to do. They look like an employee. They smell like an employee. You fire them like an employee then you have no choice. They're a freaking employee. I'm sorry. That's the way it is. If they have bring their own equipment, they can work when they want. You sub out the work as if you're subbing out to them as another janitorial business and you're just a middleman and you have the right legal paperwork involved, you might be able to get away with a 1099 scenario. It is difficult. It is tricky. Even hair salons around the country are having to put their stylus on as W-2s. Uh, every business is facing this issue. Truck driving companies. All these people are like, they're 1099. Prove it. So be careful. I'm going to tell you 95% of the time, you're going to want the employee relationship anyway. It gets you workers comp insurance coverage if anything happens to them while they're working. Ugh. Tough topic. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to let you know, I my first job actually was as a janitor at the elementary school I went to as a kid. I was in junior high. So I used to clean the old elementary school I went to. Um, Okay. I've got a question from Bo, um, who's in Phoenix. So I got to, you know, give a shout out to to those in Phoenix. Hey, guys, love the content. Bo from Phoenix. Question on entity structure. We want to start investing in real estate with our daughter and son-in-law. Should we form a holding LLC partnership to define ownership and have a own sole member of rental LLCs? or somehow use my existing S-Corp? All right, great question. First, if you're doing rental real estate here, which it sounds like what you're planning to do, as you mentioned, rental LLCs, um, your S-Corp is not gonna be in the mix at all. Don't just, it's not gonna be involved, period. Okay, S-Corp is for operational business, or maybe you're flipping a property or doing a real estate development or you know building a home, like that's S-Corp. Rentals, are not going to come in the mix. S Corp should not be in the mix at all. Now, as to a partnership entity with son-in-law and daughter-in-law, that could work. Um, and we generally do a partnership LLC. And you can we can get to the holding company and sole member rental LLCs here in a second. But let's just talk about, let's just say you want to buy one property. Let's just start small here. Let's see the three of you um, want to buy a rental. Well, in this partnership LLC, we would want to know, well, what's everyone doing? Are you putting in the money and your son-in-law and daughter-in-law are doing the work? Are you all putting in money and all equally doing work? Um, Who's doing what? So that's what we want to know first. Then we're going to set the terms of the holding company. Now, here's the hard thing. If you're going to keep using this entity over and over as the holding company, and you're going to have additional properties you're buying, let's say, every year, it's going to get complicated because if this same entity is the holding entity and is every deal going to be the same? Are you guys all putting in money on every deal? Are you the only one putting in money? What are they doing in the mix if they're not putting in money? I, I don't know. So let's keep, let's say it's easy. Like, like even Mark and I with us, like if we are 50, 50 on LLCs and on real estate, well, we know we're both going to put in money. We're both going to do an equal amount of work to make that happen it's cut and dry. We're doing the same thing. And we have an equal responsibility and obligation between each other to do the same thing. 
Is that how you're going to do it with your son and daughter-in-law? Is it the three of you doing this? Is this you 50% and your son and daughter-in-law taking the other 50%? Are you, you know, I, I just don't know. So you want to talk through that and make sure there's a clear understanding. And the first thing I would think of before you start figuring out how to structure this is, is this going to be the same way we're going to do it on every property? If you're not sure on that, I wouldn't get into thinking this is a one holding company strategy and then um, and adding the property LLCs on top of it. So start with what you've agreed to. I think the, the holding company strategy can work and you can do the sole member um, at rental LLCs for individual property for asset protection. Um, but I'm, we're assuming, of course, that every one of those deals is going to be the same. If you're like, now each deal is going to be cut different, we might have different ownership based on who's putting in what, then you're just going to do separate LLCs for each separate property. And that's sometimes how partnerships have to work out. Okay. So I want to tackle a very controversial topic. And I just actually jumped off to make a phone call to one of our accountants in the accounting firm to make sure I had our policy before we, we put this on the public airways. And I want to talk about Forex trading, crypto trading, uh, uh, equity trading, uh, any sort of stock trading, and um, it's an instance where people think they're a day trader. And this could be precious metals, currency, anything like that. Now, I want to make this clear for everybody out there. Do not search for an article on the web that says you can do something that is not allowed. And I'm going to tell you what the rule is right here. And if, as, as a very aggressive law firm and accounting firm helping small business owners around, owners around the country, we want you to get the best tax write-off. Matt, do we want people to pay more taxes? I mean, yeah, that's like our our mission is to make you only pay as much as you absolutely have to. So, yeah. And this drives you couldn't me. tell from listening to our podcast. Then. Yeah. And so we're out there, Matt. I want you to echo in on this, everybody. This is part of an article I'm working on right now, too. If you are a day trader, first, you have to show that it's your primary source of income, whatever you're trading. And you now have a business, which is now earned income and subject to self-employment tax. People go, oh, no, 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 I'm a Forex trader, it's passive. Oh, oh, it's passive? Okay. Then it goes on a Schedule D and you get to deduct what you bought the stock for and that's it. Oh, well, I was reading an article here on this website that said I get to deduct my business expenses because I'm a Forex trader. No, hold it. Which one are you? Are you a passive trader where it's ca ca capital gain, Schedule D is in David, or are you a business and we're Schedule C where you better have an S-Corp and you're going to pay self-employment tax. Well, no, but, but well, look at, I'm looking at a website right now. I won't even say what company it makes me so mad. Well, use the market to market accounting method, take advantage of wash sale rules and all that. Okay, cool. Deduct your expenses involved in your trading activity. Oh, so your business. Okay. And then the next line says, reap the benefits of not being subject to self-employment tax. Unlike Schedule C taxpayers, you are not, hold it. This article is a lie. It is wrong. Now, I'm hoping this article is over four years old because before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you could take an investment expense against trading. That's no longer available. That's a Schedule A item that is now long gone. So I'm going to repeat this for everybody. <laughs> you cannot have your cake and eat it too. Either you're a day trader of crypto or whatever you want to do, and that's a business and you better pop it on a, an S corp and you get expenses, but it's also subject to self-employment tax and you better not have some other day job or you're a passive trader and you do not get to write off all these business expenses because you're not a business, you're a passive trader. Mm. Ooh, do I look bad? I'm sorry, Matt. What would you add? Right. Bring okay. us back to the earth, bring us back to earth, save our well, people. I actually want to challenge you on something you said here. Okay. Okay. All right. I mean, what good is cake if you can't eat it? <laughs> you can't have your cake and eat it too. I've never understood that saying. What well, like, I'll explain what to else you. am I going to do with it? That cake was made for eating. Well, that's right. See, that's what's happening here, Matt. You got to look at this importantly. They want their cake and to eat it too. Meaning, they want the business write-offs and they want capital gain. You can't yeah, have that. I know. I know how the I know how the analogy works. I just never yeah. understood it. So yeah. So when you say you can't have your cake and eat I it love too, cake. yeah. So what good is it? If Everything you else you said, I'm totally in agreement with. I yeah, know. and, and I'm with you. Yeah, and it is. It is. Um, 
that that's the hard thing is you know particularly day traders and stuff you know they're they they google everything to death and careful what you find on the internet all yeah. right just just because someone threw it out there doesn't mean it's legit look up the person or place who submitted that what credentials do they have yeah is it CCA behind their name are they an attorney like are they just some guru with the website that that acts like they know what they're talking about so i just know. always it makes consider Consider the source of your information. Yeah, and I hate this. This article tells you just what you want to hear. Oh, I do get yeah. my cake and eat it too. And at the top it says, the content of this article is based on the author's opinions and recommendations alone and is not intended to be a source of investment advice. It has not been reviewed, commissioned, or otherwise endorsed by da, da, da. That means if you go do this and get audited, you get screwed and the IRS takes away you know penalties and interest out of your bank account, it's not their fault. But they threw an article out there that sounded great. Oh, yeah, makes me so mad. All right, okay. Um, Next, all right, Laura. Laura asked a question. She says, um, "Oh, hello, Mark." Okay. Oh, well, hello, I should have Laura. skipped that one, Laura. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> let me read this for Mark. Okay, hello, Mark. Okay. I recently got my PPP loan about a week ago. Congratulations. We presume this is your first one. I want to be sure I do the disbursement correctly. I'm a 1099 sole prop and file under my own name. I want to be clear when I take the distribution for paying myself, do I take the amount I received and divide it by eight weeks and then pay myself that amount for eight weeks in a row? Thanks for your help. Well, All Laura, right. I got to. You want to answer that first? I mean, she really didn't care what I thought. She said she, didn't. she wanted to know what Mark thought. I like how she put hello, Mark, and then the little heart. That was really nice. Yeah. No, she yeah. didn't. Okay. No. <laughs> I'm sorry, Laura. I'm just messing around. Okay. Um, Laura, everything you were saying is pretty good, except you have 24 weeks, not eight. So uh, everything else I'm good with. So anybody okay. that gets a PPP loan, it is tax free. It's automatically forgiven. It's a very easy one page form at the end of the process. Um, but yeah. you've got 24 weeks to take the money. Now, Laura, you could do it in eight weeks. Free. You yeah. could do it in two weeks. But you don't have to do it that re yeah. religiously. I think, eight weeks. Yeah. And I think the well, that's our recommendation on PPP in general is obviously pay yourself you know, actually write checks out rather than transfers. If that's what you typically do, notate what it's for, you know, weekly payment, you know, um, it's not technically payroll, right? Cause you're a sole prop. So you're not paying yourself payroll technically. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I like actually having a record of payment because you do need to show that it went from your separate bank account you use for your business to your personal account. Now, if you've never had a separate bank account for your business and your personal account, well, you better start now. And let's show that, that this is coming from a separate business bank account into your personal account. The other thing I would say is, Laura, if this was under 50000 you don't even have to show this when you go submit your application for forgiveness. So you're going to be able to just check the boxes and said, I complied with the rules. I used it properly and give me my forgiveness. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. Most sole props are under 50000 So. Um, in the total PPP loan amount. So you might have the easy route anyways. But still, just for audit protection and just have good records, I like, and you know, you could cut it over every two weeks, just cut yourself a check or maybe monthly for the next couple months, just cut yourself two checks. But I like having an actual physical check rather than just a transfer. Um, okay, I'm gonna, let's stick on this um, government assistance topic for just one moment. Um, this is from Andrew, question that flew in today on the website says, hey guys, thanks for doing your show. It's helped my, many businesses, including ours, in ways you probably couldn't even realize. Thanks so much, Andrew. That means a lot. Um, we do have a lot of people that share stories that really make our job rewarding. We love it. Um, he says, on the ERTC, now this is the Employee Retention Tax Credit. Oh boy. So this is very complicated. This is what you can do on, in, in conjunction with PPP. You have to have payroll to do this. So Laura, who is a sole proprietor, doing her little PPP is not going to qualify for the ERC. For those that have an S corp with W two pay, this is another opportunity. Now I, let me pose the question, and I'll tell you the controversy. He says our business is an S corp with four owners who are all family members. However, none of them own fifty percent or more of the business. It's thirty, 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 ten. 
Can we claim the ERTC tax credit? And if allowed to, could we then claim any other employees who are family members since no one is over 50% threshold? Um, so Andrew, this is the controversial point. It is out there on a lot of the accounting websites, um, the board of accountancy. People are coming out with opinions on both sides of the aisle on this. Some are saying very strictly that the owner is not allowed to take the ERTC period. Some are saying, well, if their ownership is under 50, they can. Um, some are saying, well, I could, at least I can pay family members and they can, I get the ERTC on them. And then there's a strict interpretation that says, no, you can't. Here's what I'm just going to say. We are not publicly coming down on a policy on this uh, from our firm on which side of we're taking. It's a case by case analysis. And you have to make sure that the person advising you on your payroll tax return preparation, that they're going to stand behind that advice. Uh, there are accounting firms out there that are saying, hey, we'll get the credit for you. And we take a percentage, 2%, 5 I've seen as high as 10 which I think is very, very exorbitant. Um, but if you use a company to prepare and apply for the credit on your behalf, they should be standing behind their recommendation. Make sure they do. Anybody says, yeah, you could, or you couldn't, but it's not our fault if you get audited. Then what the heck are you paying them for? So, uh, Andrew, get out there, talk to your professional that's going to be doing your quarterly payroll reports and tax return to make sure they will stand behind the advice based on your particular set of circumstances. I wish I could say more, Andrew. I apologize. Get out. I'd start with your current accountant right now, see where they stand because they got to sign off on it and their malpractice insurance should cover it if they're wrong. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. This is from uh, Raj PMAC. And this has some retirement stuff in it, but it's not self-directed here. It's just some, I think it's some good things. I'm going to hit it. It says, um, hi, Mark and Matt. As I work on a strategy of taking 401k taxable income, either at 55 or 59, the latest, can I invest in real estate during those years, keep my earnings under 100000 and qualify for the real estate professional rental losses, if I have any, to help with the tax deduction, tax reduction strategy with depreciation and passive income pass through losses. Meanwhile, I can roll over income into Roth IRAs as well and try and reduce any taxable income until 70 or 72 when I'll be required to take an RMD. Okay. Not exactly sure what you're trying to get at here, but let me walk through capability. Yes, I mean, you can start taking money from a 401k. Some 401k plans allow it to be taken out at 55. Um, uh, but rather than 59 without a 10% early withdrawal penalty, that's a little nuance there. Usually it's 59 and a half though, to be safe. But let's say you're 50, it's 59 and a half in your instance, you're taking it out. Can I keep my earnings under a hundred thousand and qualify for real estate professional losses? Yes. Now, if your earnings are under a hundred thousand, you may get the active real estate ability to take up to 25,000 in rental real estate losses without even being a real estate professional. So only those who are making over a hundred thousand and actually a little bit more, um, do you want to be a real estate professional to then take all your rental real estate losses against your other income? But let me say this: if you don't have the 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 ability to take rental real estate losses and use them against other income, is really only valuable if you're high income. If your income's under a hundred grand. Your tax saving, like your effective tax rate at 100,000 might be 10 or 20%. Like you're not getting a huge tax savings when you're making under 100,000 or less, particularly if you're married. So I don't, I wouldn't focus too hard on getting rental real estate losses to offset income at that income bracket. Now, if you're in the 37% tax bracket, you're making a couple hundred, few hundred thousand a year. Yeah, those rental real estate losses are much more valuable because you're paying at a much higher rate on that top end of income. Um, and then of course, yes, you can be rolling funds over and I presume I mean converting to Roth so that that money is gonna grow and come out totally tax-free um, uh, over time, which remember with Roth IRAs, there's no RMD that you have to take the money out later. So I hope that helps Raj. I'm not entirely certain I hit the nail on the head on what you're trying to do there, but um, hopefully that, that detail helps you work through the question. 
Okay, I'm going to try to answer two or three questions really quickly without a lot of explanation so that in our last five minutes or so here, we can cover a number of questions that came in. Uh, first one, um, investing young, love that um, handle, says, does everyone that invests in Bitcoin have a physical Bitcoin? Uh, actually, it's the opposite. No one has a physical Bitcoin. <laughs> no such thing exists. Um, we joke around it all the time that I hold up a gold Bitcoin here, but there's no such thing. It's an algorithm, blockchain technology. It's an equation. It's a very technical. Um, Matt himself has recommended to understand Bitcoin probably the best if you want to do a deep dive one night. Put on your thinking cap, have a Diet Coke and some popcorn. There's a class offered online through MIT is there a cost for that, Matt? Or where do, is it? Uh, no, it's free. It's, it's on YouTube. It's free. Okay. MIT has tons of stuff up on their website that's just on YouTube. It's free. Who is like, the you professor you like? Any class on MIT for free. Wow. Who is the professor you liked at MIT that gave that? Do you remember that? I uh, don't know. I'm in about, I'm about halfway through it. Uh, I forget his name. <laughs> I'll just okay. get it here. Okay. Um, next question. Own an Gary Gensler. Gensler. Yeah. Gensler. G-E-N-S-L-E-R. Anybody interested on a quick tutorial? It, we've heard a lot of good about that. Matt himself is watching. it. Okay. With another question. Let me say this, though. This might be part of the question, though. Let me just say this. Is um, some people think you have to buy a whole Bitcoin. Because people are like, a Bitcoin is, you know, $62,000 right now is the, like the pr price today of, a, of one Bitcoin, approximately. Well, you don't have to buy one Bitcoin at a time. It's not like you're buying in $62,000 chunks. Like you can buy 0 0.000 piece of it. You could buy a thousand of Bitcoin and you're buying a piece of one Bitcoin. So it's not like you have to, it's not like you have to buy the whole thing. I mean, maybe that's part of the question. I don't yeah, know. no, I like it. Um, and there's also, I thought you were going to say cold storage uh, strategies yeah. where you actually hold the coin on a flash drive. Don't lose it. Okay, um, Edwin says, own an S-Corp with brother. Are we allowed to pay our kids tax-free income up to 12K? Edwin, bless your heart. Um, that's the Southern term for what's coming next you're not going to like. Um, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> own an S-Corp with my brother. First of all, I would never recommend you own an S-Corp with your brother. Not because I don't like your brother, but because we talked about this at the beginning of the show. You do not want an S Corp with anyone but your spouse, period. I don't care if it's kids, mom and dad. An S Corp, it's very tricky to write off expenses that don't want that are not going to be reimbursed entirely for both parties. And you're going to have all sorts of write-offs that you're going to want, like paying a kid that one of your other partners are going to not want to do or do at a different level. So the first issue is reorganize the structure of your business so that each brother has their own escort. That's point number one. Next, you're not allowed to pay your kids tax-free 12 grand. What you're allowed to do is pay your kids for legitimate services in their business to any amount. I've seen clients pay their kids 45 grand. I've seen them pay their kids $450. It just depends on what the kids do to earn that, that wage, for lack of a better word, that pay in the business. Now, they don't pay taxes up to the first 12550 this year on earned income working for the family or anybody for that matter. So it's not just this, oh, I can write a check to my kids for tax-free income. No, they're working in the business. It's legitimate. And if they're over age 18, it's a whole different structure. If they're under age 18, it's a different structure. I've got books and podcasts, Matt, and I've covered how many times this on our show. Please go back into the history of how to pay children in the business. You will love it. But be careful with that. And the answer is no, you're not going to pay the kids out of the S Corp with your brother's kids, your kids. You're talking about a mess right now. So get a consultation on that. Last quickie, and then Matt, I'm going to let you do two or three quickies, is okay. can I reimburse myself for home office expenses out of my S Corp? Yes. Um, and this is kind of easy by Tatey. Um, yes. When you have an S Corp, you don't actually don't take the home office expense. You're reimbursing you the employee for the benefits of using your home office. You're going to use a lot of the same calculations to get there, but that's for home office use. Now, but when you say home office expenses, that makes me concerned because we're going to write off cell phone and internet and computers and equipment in different spots than the home office expense. So 
kind of kind of easy by Tady. Make sure you talk to your accountant. I've got articles on all these different topics in other YouTube videos. Matt, quick two right. or three you want to knock out? Yeah, this is Tina from website. Hi, Mark and Matt. I own and live in a condo for five years now. I want to move to a different location and rent out my rent out my condo. Can I convert it to a primary? from a primary to a rental and still capture the section 121. Section 121 is the sell of home section. I was told to set up an S corp and sell it to my S corp on an installment basis. Is there an easier route? Okay, do not sell it to your own S corp. All right, no, <laughs> why not would good. you do that? That's... First of all, the sell of home exemption is gonna get blown up because only individuals can qualify for the sell of home exemption. So the S corp's gonna blow that. Well, um, well but also, what she's saying is, I'd sell it to the S Corp, capture my sale of home exemption as an individual, and then okay. re and then reestablish a new basis under the S Corp. Yeah, under the S Corp, which you cannot do because you can't the, the sale of home exemption does not allow you to sell it to a, a you know yourself or a company you own. That's just not gonna work. Um, so uh, the easier route. You could put it into an LLC that you own. You could still get the sale of home exemption if it's a disregarded entity for tax purposes. And we wouldn't want an S Corp for a rental anyways, but the sale of home exemption is gonna die in three years. So you have three years to rent that out and still keep that sale of home exemption for any gain you've gotten that property from since you've owned it until now. So I think that's your best route. I'm not aware of a way you can use an installment rule or some way to sell it to yourself in a legit strategy where you'll still get the sell of home exemption. If you read that section 121, there are restrictions in there on the buyer of this, and it's going to restrict it being a company you personally own. I agree with Matt wholeheartedly and would say you can capture the 121 if you sell it to a family member, but it's got to be an arm's length transaction. The yeah. IRS will use what's called the step transaction doctrine that if you're just trying to create a sham where you're selling it to one of your kids to get it and then the kid sells it back to you, if you're audited and that you're caught, you're not going to go yeah. to jail, but they're going to want the tax and penalty back, with tax yeah. back and that, with penalty. And, and so. if you think about it, that's an easy one for the IRS to catch because you're going to sell the property. It's been This address has been on your tax return. Then it's gonna, you're going to get the gain and claim the sell of home exemption. Then it's going to pop back up on your return as a rental property. It's just, you're kind of, you're kind of, thumb in your nose, so to speak, or, or, or giving the finger to the IRS and be like, did you see this? Yeah. <laughs> see what I did here? I don't like it. What I'd like to do is if you're going to keep the property longer than three years, see how it goes for three years. You might find out yeah. this is not a great rental. You may find out it's you, you've found other rentals that are a better experience and you want to cash out. That's a great opportunity to sell. You could do an installment sale at that time to someone else or just sell and pay the tax. You yeah. could do a 1031 exchange and still capture the 121 mm -hmm. on the amount up until the point you converted it. You also might do a seller refi. You say, it is a good rental, but I'm going to just refi. So not a re seller refi, I'm sorry, owner refi. You're going to refi it, strip out some cash and go buy another rental and just say, you know what? I'm going to walk away from the 121. It's just too good of a rental to sell. So I like Matt's idea of just wait and see, make it a rental mm -hmm. for three years and then reevaluate Yeah. Yeah, and you could use the LLC, like I said, for asset protection since it's turning to rental, and it's still gonna it's gonna be single member disregarded. You'll still get the sale of home exemption, and you'll get the liability protection as it's now turned into a rental. All right, um, one more. Did I get the final sure. one. You get the final one. All right, this is Eric. He says I'm a general dentist. Um, I was advised to title my dental practice in my trust. I thought a dentist has to be the owner of the corporation. I was advised to title my boats in the trust. I was also advised to title my boats in the, my trust. Enjoy this show. Thank you very much, Mark and Matt David from Michigan. Okay, this is a good question. We generally want your assets, your companies, your LLCs, your S corporation to be owned by your trust for estate planning purposes so that when you pass away, the trustee of the trust can come in and just divvy up the assets as you indicated in your estate plan in your trust. If you don't have a trust or your trust or you have a trust and it doesn't own your companies, those are going to have to go to probate and a probate court judge is going to have to decide how the ownership is going to get moved around and approve those things. You don't want to be doing that. Now, for certain professionals, and this is the same for me and Mark or for a dentist, doctor, anyone who's a licensed professional 
who's providing professional services. Most states require that to be provided in a professional corporation or a PLLC. Now you would want those to be an S corp. Like I have a PC that's an S corp. Mark has a PC professional corporation. That's an S corp. Um, so you would probably have something like that, Eric, that's what we'd recommend. Now, when you set up the corporation and for licensing purposes, you would be the owner of it, but we are going to transfer that ownership by a stock transfer or a membership transfer to a PLLC to your trust. Cause we want for estate and legal planning purposes, your trust to be the owner of it. Um, now we have never seen, um, department of licensing agencies care of that. Um, if you ask them, you're going to get convoluted responses about how the individual does have to be an owner because that's what's in the code and most professional corporation sections. Um, but you're still the owner in your trust, even if you have a spouse in the trust. Um, frankly, if you're in a community property state, your spouse owns half the company anyways, even if it is a professional um, entity in, in most states. So I, I wouldn't stress too much on that. Now, the boats, titling the boats into the trust, maybe. Um, I don't know that like on boats usually have a title, of course, but those aren't as difficult to transfer over. You could, but those typically don't have to go to probate. You usually can show a death certificate on boats and cars. Um, and the trustee can usually move those without being on, but I don't know. Do you recommend that? Put your I, boat in the name of the trust? I do. I, I think when in doubt, um, move assets into your trust. It, it's something that can easily be done when you're at the DMV doing your annual renewal. Uh, if you don't have liens against property, that's even easier. If you've got a loan at the bank for bank, uh, bank for boaters, um, <laughs> gonna, they're going to not allow you to do that until you have the title free and clear. But even I was in Wells Fargo the other day and they said, hey, do you want to transfer the ownership of your personal account to your trust while you're here? I'm like, I'm very impressed. Thank you. What do you have a form for that? She goes, "Yep, your two-page form." And she goes, "It won't change the name on your account, and it won't change your checks. It's just yeah. gonna it won't change your account number. But if you die, your trust is automatically the owner." I go, "Hand it over." So I think whenever you can make your trust the owner, you're doing your family a favor. You're making life a lot easier for them, and it won't hurt. But on these LLCs and corporations for businesses and professional practices. The DOL, the department, sorry, not the DOL, the DOPL, Department of Professional Licensing, they're really looking through a lot of those trusts to just see who the real professional is. And whenever you can have your trust, the owner of everything and every, you know, anything and everything, the better. Yeah. So. Cool. Okay. Take us out. All man. right. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for listening to Main Street Business Podcast. Thanks for all those that submitted your questions. Remember, you can go to MainStreetBusiness.com. Right out there on the homepage, there's submit a question. If you, one pops into your brain, just go throw it in there. Mark, we did go back of a couple of weeks here of, of questions that we pulled from. Um, and try to submit questions that you think other people will enjoy hearing. If you got a weird situation or a, you're asking about line this on this tax return in your odd situation, that's not a great question we're going to read. So try to give one you think would be helpful to other listeners. Um, and most of them are in the small business, real estate, retirement tax, all that stuff. You know, those are questions uh, we love to, to uh, field here on the show. And if you like the show, please give us five-star rating on whatever podcast channel um, you, uh, you subscribe to and listen to this. And thanks for being with us. We'll be back next week with another amazing episode. Keep living the dream. <laughs>